Okay, great. Welcome. Thank you for joining us this evening for a discussion on doing business in South Korea. My name is Chelsea Watts. I'm the Director of Global Programs and Partnerships at the Feliciano School of Business. Um, and I'm joined by three panelists and a moderator who will lead the discussion this evening. Um, just a quick housekeeping. Um, our Q&A is open. At the bottom of your screen, you see a Q&A button. You can submit that throughout our conversation. Um, if you have a question for a specific panelist, if you don't mind throwing their name in uh, when you do put that question, otherwise we'll pose the questions to the, um, to the entire panel. Um, we're going to have uh, about 35 to 40 minutes of discussion this evening, and then we'll have some time at the end for question and answer as well. Um, so a quick introduction of our panelists, and then we'll get started. Um, I'm happy to welcome Dr. Gabriel Young, who is an assistant professor of management at the Feliciano School of Business. Uh, Dr. Esther Kim, who is an assistant professor of hospitality and tourism at the Feliciano School of Business. And Dr. Yul Kim, who is an assistant professor of marketing at the Feliciano School of Business. We also have uh, Dr. Archana Kumar, who is a professor of um, marketing, who will be moderating our conversation this evening. Um, and without a uh, delay, I'll just hand it over to you, Archana. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Chelsea. Um, I'm so thrilled to be moderating this session, and I want to welcome all of you to the first event of the Virtual Global Immersion Conference. Um, I was lucky to visit South Korea last year as part of the MBA Study Abroad Program and was amazed by the culture and beauty of the country, and I hope you will get a chance to visit South Korea you know, in the near future if you have not been there uh, yet. So um, you have the bios of our three panelists. So let's start, um, you know, asking them about, um, you know, the different aspects of conducting business in South Korea. So Gabriel, um, I would like to start with you first. Um, could you share some aspects of uh, what makes South Korea unique when it comes to their geographic location? Uh, given that you know, it finds itself surrounded by the so-called three titans, China, Russia, and Japan. Thank you, Artem. Yeah. Uh, first of all, it's my privilege to share my idea with you uh, in this, uh, this Zoom uh, conference. So uh, thank, you for, uh, thank you for having me here. As Artem addressed, um, let me begin with the, the location advantage of South Korea. Yeah, conventional uh, the th uh, theory of the international business or the global business uh, has it that uh, every firm wants to seek at least one or at least one or three or uh, two or three of the uh, the advantages. First one is the ownership advantage. Second one is location advantage, and finally the internalization advantage. So Korea may be a good uh, the good uh, the but a uh, good place to provide a location advantage in terms of global business. And one stretch has it that within the, the 1200 uh, 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 miles radius of the Seoul, the capital of Korea, uh, the more than 40 cities are located within that radius. That has a more, that is, uh, that has a 1 million population or above. So it means that uh, Korea has a, the, and the unique, uh, the, the strategic value in terms of their location. And based on that, as of now, the Korea, uh, Korea has the second air cargo volume and the fifth, uh, the freight volume in terms of the international transaction, the international transaction. Uh, and that may be one of the main reasons why uh, I could, when I had a, when I could have a, a consulting project in 15 years ago, yeah, it was, one five, 15 years ago, uh, when I was working in the Accenture Seoul office, uh, when, and my client was the uh, one uh, European version of FedEx. At the time, South Korea didn't have any uh, free trade ag agreement with United States and even with China. However, uh, that company finds some kind of value in advance and they try to expand their business volume in South Korea to leverage it such kind of a uh, the location advantage. And I believe their growth in South Korea at this moment is yeah, beyond my expectation. And there may be a practical evidence of the 
location advantage exploited by global firms, even with the, and not only for the global firms, even with the small or mid, uh, middle-sized firms all over the world who has a location in South Korea. Thank you so much, uh, Gabriel, appreciate it. Um, the next question is for Esther. Uh, so from what I understand, tourism is a significant driver of uh, the economic growth in South Korea. So could you give us an overview about this industry and how it contributes to the GDP of the country? Yes, um, first of all, thank you so much for having me tonight. I'm so glad to share my opinion and knowledge about the Korean tourism and hotel industry. Um, like you mentioned that uh, tourism is a significant driver of economic growth in South Korea. According to the data provided by the World Tourism Organization, as of 2018, South Korean tourism accounted for 4.7 of GDP and 5.3 of total employment is in the tourism industry. And almost 70% of visitors come to South Korea for leisure and holiday activities, which means that the role of leisure market of South Korea becomes critical in South Korean economy. And today I would like to overview two major markets of tour tourism, which, uh, which are a domestic travel and inbound travel. Um, the majority of the South Korean tourist industry is supported by the domestic tourism. And thanks to the extensive network of public transportation, such as express trains and buses, most of the country lies within a day round trip of any major city. And one recent trend of domestic travel is a gourmet travel. Um, according to the recent survey, about 75% of the respondents answered that they visit special restaurants when traveling domestic in South Korea. In other words, food and beverage market is the most significant sector of the domestic tourism. And in terms of inbound travel, um, inbound travel is travelers coming from outside of the country, which is an international visitor. And among 17.5 million inbound visitors in 2019, 6 million visitors were from China, which is the largest group of the international visitors, followed by Japan and Taiwan. Uh, surprisingly, United States is ranked at fourth in the top nationalities of inbound visitors for all purposes. So considering the long distance between, the South, uh, between South Korea and the United States, this is a very remarkable point. And the South Korean tourism industry has a strong focus on the visitors from China. About 47% of all arrivals to South Korea were from mainland China. In 2018, the number of Chinese tourists nearly halved due to the political tense between two countries. And China imposed a group tour ban in 2018 uh, the numbers are on the rise again as the political situation come, but the industry is still recovering. And Japan is a similar case as China. South Korea often has a political conf conflict with the Japan, which ends up having a negative impact on the tourism market. A South Korean tourism industry made a long-term goal to reduce dependency on Chinese and Japanese tourists. The revenue loss from Chinese travelers boycott have been made by other Southeastern, uh, Southeast Asian countries such as Philippines, Indonesia, and Singapore where it have rel relatively less uh, political conflicts. And lastly, I would like to go over some major factors attracting international visitors. The factors may include 24 seven service and safety allowing a nightlife activity were the public Wi-Fi availability and inexpensive public transportation. But I would like to emphasize one factor, which is Hallyu. Hallyu literally means the Korean wave. And recently, South Korean culture, such as K-dramas, K-pop, K-food, K-beauty, K-fashion gained a widespread popularity. And the Korean wave attracts young generations 
So if we look at the statistic numbers, uh, about 36% of visitors in 2019 were uh, between 20 and 30, which was the most visited age group. And the second most visited age group was between 31 and 40. So the average age of the visitor is very, very young. And also the visitors res responded that uh, more than half of their spending during their visit were made because of the influence of the popular culture. So accordingly, the highly related contents become a core travel product in South Korea. And the Korean tourism government and companies focus on developing contents related business to attract more visitors, rather uh, pursuing the old fashioned way to which emphasize the cultural heritage sites. Thank you so much, Esther. Um, it was very interesting, you know, the statistics that you provided. So um, the next question is for Yul. Hi, Yul. Uh, question for you is related to entrepreneurship and the startup scene in Korea. So could you please give us some idea of how the infrastructure is set up for enabling uh, startup companies? Yeah, sure. I, I wanted to discuss some startup opportunities uh, startup opportunities in South Korea. So South Korea currently has uh, 9,000 startups and um, there are 10 unicorns. The unicorns are startups that uh, have a uh, current valuation over $1 billion. Uh, the reason why I wanted to introduce the startup opportunities in Seoul, especially, is the South Korean economy is the least impacted by the pandemic. So if you are an MBA student and if you uh, have if there's a challenge in, let's say, um, uh, looking for jobs um, in, in the state, like for a while, then uh, actually applying for startups in South Korea can be uh, a really good alternative to kind of right, explore different culture and the uh, also the market. And because South Korea has a program that actually supports uh, the flights and the accommodations and also they will fund your startup if you are selected. Uh, the program is called K Startup Grand Challenge, right? So K Startup Grand Challenge, uh, it is held every year. And if your startup idea is selected, right, as the finalist, then the uh, South Korean, uh, this organization will support your flight and accommodation and also office space, right? So that you can work on the startup and so far, Right, many international startups actually have been funded this uh, funded through this program, and they are currently working on uh, some drone delivery, right, or digital media. And also, South Korea, like Gabriel uh, discussed, has FTA with uh, most of the major markets, including European markets, right, North America, including the U.S., and also some countries in South America, like Colombia, Chile, and Panama. So once you get into that uh, startup, actually you can actually have a really wide range of customer reach. You can uh, still will be able to sell your product internationally. And also with the US, South Korea has one of the highest um, population uh, users, internet. So 95% of population uses the internet in South Korea and also 118% actually uh, subscribe to mobile phones. So uh, people have Right, on average, more than one mobile phones. And also 85% of the population are active social media users. So if you have some digital media or um, especially mobile applications, startup idea, it, be, it can make a good opportunity um, to apply for this K grand uh, global challenge. And hopefully maybe you will win the challenge and um, win the funding. That can be a good opportunity. So I wanted to introduce that um, opportunity. Thank you. you uh, yeah, and you mentioned it's called the K Startup Challenge. So it's called K Startup Grand Challenge. Grand Challenge. Okay. Yeah, you will be funded uh, at least one hundred thousand, right, for the startup, and the accommodations and flight office spaces will be provided, and okay. it's open for. Uh, the international startup right so it is not yeah it is open for international startups so, okay and is this yeah. a yearly um, funding opportunity 
Yeah, it's annual. Okay. Yeah, so I think definitely yeah. something so even if all of, Yeah, a lot of startups fail. Yeah, a lot of startups fail. Sure. But even if it fail, if you're funded and if you worked on it, it can actually make a really good app statement yeah. in your resume. Yes. And yeah, it can be a really good opportunity. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Yul. Um, the next question is for Gabriel. Uh, Gabriel, you are an expert in cross-cultural management. Um, could you tell us a bit more about the cultural difference and how the legal system is set up for enabling um, dispute resolution? Yes, Arjun. Yeah. Um, when I was an ASPEN manager uh, working in the Brazil, the Latin America, uh, the, the chairperson of my company made a visit to the Central Bank of Brazil. It's kind of a Brazilian version of the FRB. And the, the, uh, the president of uh, Brazilian Central Bank, after the meeting with the, uh, with the president of the Central, ba uh, Central Bank, uh, with, which was really successful. And finally, we got the, uh, the authorization for the uh, business in Brazil. And one interesting comment that I got from the uh, staff of the Central Bank was like this. Your boss talked a lot. And uh, I was, uh, my was, what, what do you mean? And he said, uh, uh, he had a similar meeting arrangement with the many Asian business persons. And the typical format would go like this. Uh, how to identify the boss, the real boss in the meeting, the first. The boss sit in the center of the row. Second, the boss say nothing. And third, the boss in the meeting, he falls asleep. But my boss didn't fall asleep. And my boss talked a lot and he led the meeting. And that kind of thing is the very interesting uh, comment I got from the Brazilian colleague and uh, counterpart. And it can be an evidence of the cultural difference. And we have to expect such a difference whenever we face the international transaction with the counterpart in the other side of the globe. That said, um, South, the one interesting thing about the South Korean culture that is strikingly different from uh, the uh, American culture is that Individualism versus uh, collectivism. You probably heard about it. Yeah. In many Asian culture, uh, under the, the tradition or legacy from the Confucianism, uh, we always value uh, collective, uh, the value, uh, value the, the collectivism, being together and work together, and instead of going individually. Yeah. So uh, there might be there might be kind of a common sense uh, whenever a the Western Europe or American people who start to work in uh, South Korea, uh, they should, they definitely know about oh, this country uh, we have in this country we have to uh, go together, work together, even sometimes in the night and on the in the weekend we have to go along with the colleagues in the workplace. But beyond that, uh, once uh, the difference uh, I want to mention a little bit deeper is that uh, South Korea always value the public matter over private matter. That is the difference from the collectivism in Latin America and or the Southern Europe, where the collectivism always uh, the appreciate the, and acknowledge the importance of the family affairs of the, uh, the individual workers in, uh, in every company's or work basis. It means if I have a family emergency, uh, they, or, uh, they usually tell us that you know, family comes first. You have to see you. Uh, you have to see your parents if your parents are in critical situation. So it should be all right. But in South Korea, it goes a little bit different way. It means uh, so it, it is kind of a yeah, they didn't, nobody nobody officially talk about it, but implicitly South Korean boss or the companies uh, expect uh, their uh, their workers to sacrifice personal affairs of uh, personal affairs for the purpose of uh, public affairs required by the company or the firm's agenda. So that is the main reason why the many the foreign, uh, foreign workers who are working in the South Korea company uh, complain about it. There is no personal life in South Korea. This kind of a calendar goes like this, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Friday, Friday. No Saturday, no Sunday. And uh, there may be one thing you may want to consider <laughs> if you want to join in the Korean cultural background, but definitely there is a, another uh, the bright side yeah, in experiencing the Korean culture. 
if I talk about, if I'm talking about the, the inst informal institution, when I, uh, with regard to the cultural, uh, cultural difference, the formal institutions as Archon, uh, echoing the Archon's question, uh, now is well developed. What I mean is that compared to the 30 years or 40 years ago, South Korean institution, formal institutions such as rules, regulations, and uh, legal institutions are now me, are meet, uh, now meeting the global standard. According to the statistics annually announced by the World Bank uh, in 2009, uh, 2019, World Bank announced that in their uh, project of the so-called doing business globally, and they rank South Korea in number uh, the second in terms of the easiness with regard to the legal dispute re resolution, and which is a higher rank than even the United States. And uh, it can be uh, evidence that South Korean legal institution now enables many business players, including those coming from the other countries, uh, they easily launch their business. And even in some cases, they easily exit from the South Korean uh, market. So that, um, there is a kind of, yeah, there is a yeah, pros and cons in every country's institutions, but South Korean, uh, South Korean legal system, uh, I may say that now, you know, you feel, feel like it's almost comparable to the, the institutions of the United States, your home, uh, our home country. So that may be the, uh, the ending, ending remark in part, uh, in terms of the Archon's question too. Thank you. Thank you, Gabriel, uh, for answering both, both the questions and for tying in with your uh, personal work experience. So I appreciate that. Um, the next question is for Esther. So Esther, you gave us a great insight about the tourism industry. Um, so now could you tell us a little bit more about the um, hospitality industry, specifically the business structure of the hotel industry? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, the lodging industry in South Korea has two major markets, the Seoul, which is the capital city, the Seoul hotel market and other regional markets. Seoul hotels are the major market which accommodate most foreign visitors and other regional hotels heavily rely on a domestic market. The number of hotels in Seoul uh, in South Korea reached around 780 and almost a half of the hotel supply is in Seoul. And um, as remarkable investments were made in the hotel industry, the hotel supply is, uh, has increased since 2012. And the majority of the investment in the hotel industry was made because its real estate value is expected to increase consistently. But frankly speaking, the profit margin is insufficient to maintain the hotel business. Um, so once again, a lot of investments were made because of the real estate value. So I want to share some, reason, some reasons why the Korean hotels are not generating enough, uh, enough profits. And in fact, a lot of, hotels are running other businesses such as duty fruity shop or golf courses at the same time to have stable business. And um, I want to say that there are three major reasons why the hotels in South Korea are not generating enough profits only with the room sales. I'm not saying that the entire hotel business is not generating enough of revenue, but I'm just talking about the, uh, the the profit with the only room sales. The first reason is oversupply. Besides major uh, accommodations, so there is an alternative market such as Airbnbs, guest houses, inns, or motels. And these accommodations are not included in the hotel stock statistics. And their performance are neither traceable nor recorded. And unlike the US market, small inns or motels are not star rated and their performance is not traced and recorded. And the supply of the alternative market is five times than the major market, which becomes an issue. Um, an alternative accommodation operates about 20,000 rooms and 50% are located in Seoul. 
um, the returning visitors normally seek an affordable accommodation such as Airbnb inns, motels, or guest houses. And although the supply of the major market is doubled compared to 2012, most demand was absorbed by the alternative market, which led over oversupply, especially in the Seoul major market. And the second reason is high dependency on the international market of the Seoul hotels. About 45% of hotel guests are foreign visitors and 70% of the guests in Seoul hotels are foreign visitors. In other words, uh, most of uh, foreign visitors stay in Seoul hotels. The average daily rate for an international market is usually higher than a domestic market, which means that an international market is a good revenue source, but it's not stable. For example, um, during the pandemic, the hotels who were highly dependent on the overseas market are now seriously suffering. The last reason why the Korean hotels have insufficient room revenue where the profit margin is the uh, unstable business structure of regional hotels. Many regional hotels have less productive business portfolio as they focus on the F&B business more than the hotel room business. And as I mentioned earlier, most of the country lies within a day round trip of any major city. Uh, with that means, domestic business travelers usually don't need an accommodation while having a business travel to other regions. In other words, the majority of the guests in regional hotels are staying for leisure and travel purposes. And unlike the business travelers uh, who think a hotel room is the most critical factor when they choose a hotel, nice and good restaurants are critical factors for the leisure travelers. So the uh, local, the regional hotels need to have the nice and good restaurants at the same time. But this business structure is not ideal because of high direct expenses of the uh, food and beverage business. The direct expense of F&B is more than 70%, while other facilities such as rooms are around 40 to 50%. So if the hotels heavily rely on the F&B business, their profit margin rate, rate gets low. So in other words, without a solid business market, the regional hotels will not be able to have a stable business structure. Thank you so much, uh, Esther. Um, just uh, um, I was reading up and I noticed this when I went to Korea last year, there were so many coffee shops is that a big trend in Korea? Coffee shops, I saw so many, like, you know, right next to each other. So it was just very interesting. Right, right. So coffee is one of the most popular trained in the, in the food and beverage industry. And I believe the uh, not even for the national chain brands such as Starbucks, that there are a lot of local independent mm -hmm. coffee shops as well. And the barista license is actually one of the most promising um, uh, job in the food and beverage market because uh, running a independent coffee shop is also considered as a running a uh, private business. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Um, the next question is for uh, both you and Esther. So um, could you both highlight how the pandemic um, has had an impact on the marketing and the hospitality industry? And I was looking at the chat, there was also a question from uh, Kara Housel. So she asks, uh, Ray, uh, Yul, um, you know, why do you think South Korea's economy and businesses have been impacted the least by the pandemic? Okay. So, Yul, yeah. so I'll answer the question first. I think the reason why the South Korean economy was the least impacted by the pandemic uh, is because the government intervention was early. So the disease this, this spread is very right, intrinsic, intrinsically network effect. So let's say the like South Korean government intervened, right, to track down the spread uh, when they were around like 1,000 people, right, who were infected. But I see the European right, governments or the government here uh, was not really uh, willing to intervene right until there were just too many people to actually track down the virus. So um, 
the timing was too late. And also the COVID virus can really depends on person, but some people really get affected a lot. And I read this article recently, like there were some kind of genes that actually uh, make people more vulnerable. Uh, people with this gene more vulnerable to COVID kind of uh, symptoms. So, um, so in the government perspective, they kind of have to had to shut down the economy to really slow down uh, the spread. But I think the timing was too late and network effect, the spread already has progressed right to far, right to kind of contain it. And um, I think that's the reason why the South Korean economy was uh, less impacted, impacted. And also, I mean, to give you a background, I think there are a lot of uh, political kind of the, the South Korean government for now, they are the democratic government who got in the presidency after eight years. So there's more pressure right to them that they have to really do well to prove that they can um, kind of run the country well not only the conservative government in ways, I think there, there's kind of certain factor uh, to that as well, because the South Korean government has maybe feel more pressure to really do this um, well. And also the impact of the pandemic uh, has been really similar, right, on both uh, the US and South Korea. So, so uh, the one thing, right, the McKinsey uh, surveyed, right, the consumers in both countries, and one thing really, uh, noticeable right after the pandemic is that the consumers are engaging in more mindful consumption, right? So mindful consumption can indicate two things. So the consumers care, right? Gives more efforts, efforts and um, attention when they make purchases. Um, they also try to assess, right? The value of their purchase and value here can mean two things. So first is price. And the second is the corporate social responsibility. The consumers care more about the uh, value, the price for the quality, and also consumers care how their purchase right, would impact uh, the bigger kind of societal or environmental um, effect. So this kind of mindful consumption has been kind of a consumption pattern uh, that were that have been noticeable from Generation Z, right? The younger consumers or millennials. But now because of the pandemic, this kind of uh, mindful consumption patterns are spreading into the older demographics as well that a lot more boomers and Gen X also uh, start to care about uh, the corporate kind of social impact as well. One other noticeable pattern is a lot of people are shopping online now. So actually only 10% of right, total transaction have been happening um, online e-commerce. Uh, both in the South Korea and the U.S. So other 90% of sales have, been, um, have happened in store, right, physically till now. But because of this COVID pandemic, a lot more people are using um, online shopping. And actually because of COVID, there was survey results that um, consist consistently throughout the generations, 10% of people actually tried shopping online for the first time because of the pandemic. <clears throat> and after they used right, this kind of online shopping for the first time and they get used to it, they already paid the learning cost, right, to shop online. So it's likely that they will continue to do this even after pandemic passes. So I recommend businesses to kind of innovate, right, how people shop online because the way we shop online hasn't changed, right, at all since the eBay, right, came out in 1990s. So uh, I think there are a lot of kind of multimedia technology that we have, like, virtual reality or argumental reality, right? To innovate, right? How we shop online to replicate our shopping experiences in uh, physical retail stores as well. And, and really, I wanted to give this uh, one example. So the Forever 21 uh, went bankrupt uh, last year, around October. And H&M, right, on the contrary is, um, reaching record sales. Um, and they're both fast fashion uh, companies. So fast fashion have solid demands, but the reason why Forever 21, right, kind of went down and h and was going up is obvious that Forever 21 wasn't, in, uh, wasn't investing in digital sales or their um, digital marketing channels, right? While h and was uh, aiming to 
make more than 30% of sales, right, online. So they are focused toward different, and while Forever 21 was actually expanding the retail stores. And also the other thing is the H&M try to cater, right, the customers kind of demand for CSR, corporate social responsibility, and they launch a lot of uh, new clothing lines, right, that are made out of recycled fabric, right. But Forever 21 really kind of neglected that kind of factor. So this kind of case show uh, these two right kinds of value that you need to really care about the uh, price and also as well as the corporate social responsibility. And now that people are buying things increasingly online, for example, uh, the online grocery sales per se uh, increased, uh, tripled, right? Tripled in the US and increased by 60% in South Korea. So a lot more people will buy um, products online and I think business should be ready for that. And also keep in mind that the price and the costs, right, are really, will be an important kind of marketing keywords after uh, the pandemic. Thank you so hey. much, uh, Esther. Hey. Yes, um, just like any other countries, the impact of the COVID-19 on, COVID on the tourism industry in South Korea is very critical. Um, as of October 2020, 918 travel agency closed and there was about 9 trillion US dollar revenue loss. So considering the size of the country, uh, it is a huge impact. And it, in addition, the number of foreign visitors um, to South Korea was expected to decrease by 2 million. We had 17, almost 18 million visitors in 2019. So it was a huge drop. Uh, the majority of the hotels and travel business reduced employment and implement a contingency plan. The contingency plan of the hotels may include close out by floor, temporarily close some of the hotel facilities such, uh, such as spa, shortening uh, restaurant operation hours, etc. And people in the industry expect that the leisure dem demand is expected to recover recovered fast, but the full recovery is expected to take about a year from the point that we are back to the normal life. Um, MICE, which is meeting incentives, conference, conventions, and um, exhibition market, and a leisure group demand will recover faster than the, uh, just regular corporate demands, but the full recovery for the both expected to take longer than the corporate demand. And overall, the people expect that the full recovery will take about an hour after we, we are back to the normal life. And while pervasive, uh, the pessimistic outlook is pervasive, some argue that it is just a new travel paradigm, which is the new, uh, new normal. In fact, the new paradigm of the travel industry is a global change. So other countries, including the US market, are also experiencing the similar changes. Uh, there are three major changes that the in industry uh, is experiencing due to the pandemic. The first one is the increase of last minute bookings. If we look at the booking trend, the average booking window gets shorter with an average of 2.5 days, which means that people are likely to make a last minute reservation. People concern about the rapid changes of the travel regulation. So they just wait until last minute to book a hotel. And also many hotels recognize that this uncertain situation. So they ease their cancellation policy as well. And the second change is a uh, quality focused travel, especially in South Korea, as the travel ban continues, people don't fly. And some people, as, and as people can save some their travel expenses from their air, air flight, uh, people are likely to spend that saving money for a better accommodation. The demand for a private pool villa has dramatically increased. And this demand reflects the current demand that people 
pray for the place that they can maintain a social distance and minimize the contact with the other random people. Um, so the hotels need to focus on the security and safety and cleanness of the hotel as marketing points. The last, trend, last change is the polarization of the length of stay. It is either very short or very long. Since a day round trip is possible in the majority of the cities in South Korea, during the pandemic, people prefer a day round trip without an overnight stay or they stay for weeks. A lot of people can work from home these days. So people leave their home and stay at Airbnb house or a private pool villa for weeks. And I believe, uh, I, I believe that other countries have seen a similar travel patterns as South Korea. Thank you so much, uh, Esther and Yoon. Um, we, the last question for this session is for uh, Gabriel, and I think it will be relevant to our uh, students. So could you please let us know if there are any opportunities for our students to work in South Korea after graduation? So how easy is it to find a job and you know uh, things like that? Yes, Anshu. Yeah. Uh, before I start my PhD program and getting a job as a faculty member in Montclair, uh, I used to serve in a, as a the vice president who was in charge of the global strategy of the company in, in, in South Korea. And in my team, I had three uh, colleagues who, was, who were foreign. One is Chinese, the other is British, and the third one is American. And when I asked that question, how did you get this job opportunity uh, to join this company? Because when I transferred, uh, repatriated from uh, Brazil to South Korea and get the, get the responsibility, those are three were already there uh, in, uh, in my division. And they joined before I start my, my work in Seoul. Uh, in Seoul. Their answer was that uh, two mentioned about the local community of their, uh, their nationals in South Korea, and one uh, applied uh, applied for through uh, applied through the, the official job postings. And uh, before starting this meeting, uh, I because of my personal curiosity, I went through the job uh, glassdoor.com, and it it has the many postings about the, the job opportunities in South Korea. And I don't think of um, glassdoor.com is the official uh, the arena for the South Korean companies. They posted uh, the uh, job opportunities uh, for the uh, U.S. citizens. So if you try to find out the way to uh, leverage such uh, information uh, in South Korean uh, the websites or the job seeking uh, the companies, you may find the, the more information about the South Korean uh, job opportunities. What I can tell you is that compared to the uh, 25 years ago, when I started my first job in my in my career in South Korea, the uh, the openness to the foreign uh, the uh, foreign aspects in view of South Koreans has a has, uh, experienced a drastic change in a positive way. And now uh, South Korea is known to many uh, the international uh, the young professionals. It's a very very good place to work there in terms of the securities, in terms of the amenity, and in terms of the, the, uh, in terms of the, the job opportunities at the same time. So it is up to you to find out, uh, the, uh, it is up to you to, up to your endeavor if you are really interested in working in South Korea. And one other channel I can mention is that if you start working in Korean company in United States, in America, uh, there may be another option uh, for you to get transferred to the South Korea and continue your work. Uh, one of the division head, uh, division head I worked together was the British guy, and it's different from the British uh, the employees. He started his work in my company's uh, British, uh, the subsidiaries in UK, but he was transferred from there to South Korea and he, started, he continued his job. And there can be another option for you. Uh, to be uh, to work in South Korea. One final comment: as a the entrepreneur or the startup company owner, uh, I want to echo uh, your comment. And particularly, the current relationship between United States and China 
is not so optimistic. But if you start your work, your business in South Korea, it means that in terms of corporate entity, you are getting the South Korean citizenship. It means if you do your work in South Korea as an American, but now you do your work as a South Korean company, <clears throat> it means you can have a treatment from, for example, uh, the Chinese government uh, to as a South Korean company. What I mean is that you can leverage the FTA between China and you know, uh, China and South Korea as a valid South Korean citizenship uh, companies set up in the uh, in South Korea, even though you are United States citizen. So that's the uh, value of the FTA. And in terms of the FTA, number of the FTAs South Korea has, as you mentioned, South Korea has more FTAs than United States. So if you are interested in the transaction, international transaction with the Asian countries, including China, I believe South Korea would be a good uh, the, uh, the place or arena to start your uh, own business. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Gabriel, Esther, and Yul. Thank you for your uh, insights. I think we may have time for maybe one or two questions. I know Chelsea wanted to wrap it up a little bit earlier uh, so that we can go to the next event. Yes, I think we have a couple of, I, we, we certainly won't get to all of the questions we've gotten in. Uh, we've had some great questions. Um, so I will uh, ask this one to um, the panel. Um, family or privately owned conglomerates like Hyundai, Lotte, and Samsung are so dominant in South Korea to the point where they command the lion's share of the market in entire industries. Do you see this as a strength or as a weakness of the South Korean economy? Um, I think it's a weakness. I think it's a weakness because the family-owned uh, conglomerate, conglomerate right, uh, can be really vulnerable to uh, corruption per se because they're uh, family-owned and in ways it's a little you know, nepotistic. But um, I think South Korea is in ways overcoming that um, issue really well because a lot of startups, startups are becoming uh, successful. So the Samsung is, Samsung is probably the biggest company, but still let's say like there are a lot of companies, uh, the new IT kind of companies that are bigger than let's say Hyundai or Lotte, right? So there are a lot of new uh, rich, tech rich in ways. And I think that kind of counters uh, that kind of, because it's really interesting, like Samsung, Hyundai, Lotte kind of conglomerate, if you look at uh, them, they are actually like um, interrelated as well through marriage, right? So they were this kind of really strong kind of upper um, class network in South Korea. They are also uh, should be very friendly to other kind of politicians, right? This upper class group, but now, right, a lot more um, other companies are becoming as big, right, as them. And they're like um, celebrities right through K-pop are becoming a very rich and getting into this upper class network as well. So the upper class network has been in ways really concentrated on, start, on certain families per se. I don't think that's healthy for uh, any country society. But now that is kind of right in um, breaking down, right? Like there are a lot of other like neighbor or cacao uh, kind of not really internationally known, but very uh, big companies in Korea. So it's like Google, right? Google um, in South Korea or WhatsApp in South Korea. So like there are a lot more kind of new reach. So that kind of solid network that the old conglomerate, the conglomerate uh, had field is in ways breaking down, right? So that's a good thing. And I, I don't think that kind of right solid certain a few families right upper class network is not healthy for any kind of society because it's just too much power and that's concerning. Thank you very much. I, a quick answer, maybe I, maybe uh, the panel can give me one do and one don't here. So I've got a good question on the proper business etiquette to navigate meetings in South Korea. So what would be your your, be your best suggestion for someone foreign coming into South Korea uh, in, a, in a business meeting? Uh, 
um, I I want to uh, give you one don't. <laughs> when you get a chance to have a meeting with any uh, president or CEO, uh, don't say, hey, hi. <laughs> you need to be really polite because uh, age is a big thing in South Korea. So just being familiar or friendly is good, but it's it may look very polite. So just pe just try to, to be very polite to get, especially for the elder people in the, the higher positions. Great. Any other do's or don'ts, Gabriel? Yes. Uh, adding my comments to Esther's great uh, advice. Um, uh, South Koreans are not uh, uh, used to uh, the shaking hands. So um, if you want to do it, but they know. The, the, because many of the business norms or particularly the meeting norms are now standardized in the global sense. So South, the, South Koreans are ready to shake hands with any, anybody. But one thing I want to you know, add to Esther's comments in terms of the age thing is that if you think your counterpart looks older than you, yeah, you may want to wait uh, until the, your counterpart extends your hands. So it's kind of a courtesy in South Korea instead of uh, extending hands, uh, they're waiting for the, extend, the hands from the uh, older guy uh, to the, if you are young. And that's one thing I want to add. The other one is not the matter of do's and don'ts, but um, I want to ask you to uh, keep you in your mind that in many kinds of a business meetings can be done in the dinner table. So you have many chance to have a uh, splendid uh, the meals in, of South Korea, but. Uh, you may want to get ready to take off your shoes because in many South Korean restaurants, it's kind of customary to uh, take off your uh, take off your shoes and go in step on step into the restaurant, the private rooms of the restaurant. So it may be contrary contrary to your customs, but uh, if you think if I hope you can think it's not a big deal. That's my comment. Great, thank you, Yul. Do you have any? Quick do or don't on business meetings in Korea. Business me I I think kind of in fundamental way, uh, you know, in America in business meetings, being friendly kind of equates also kind of being polite and right. You you are supposed to be friendly to your um, business right um, acquaintances. But in South Korea, you would say if your friends, your personal kind of distance is. Uh, as close as a friend's kind of relationship here. But when you meet people right through businesses, um, just assume that there's gonna be a lot more kind of distance between people, right? You are not expected to be friendly, right? Or warm or kind in ways. You're just supposed to be very uh, uh, distant, right? Compared to the work culture here per se. Great. Thank you very much. These are all really good tips. I think that um, we could probably spend a lot more time talking about doing business in South Korea, especially in light of uh, current events. And, uh, you know, when you throw in culture and meetings and, and all of this, everything gets really interesting. So I'm sorry to cut us off, um, cut us off at this point, but want to sincerely thank the panelists and moderator as well um, for the conversation this evening. Uh, it was really enlightening. I think our students got a lot out of it. Um, and I, so everyone knows we will, you know, we recorded the session, so we will share that out. Um, with everyone as well, if you'd like to uh, have a recap or, or check it out a second time. Um, and for now, we will say good evening. Um, if you are an MBA student and you're participating in the Global Immersion Conference, uh, We uh, will need to switch. Uh, you'll see at the bottom of this screen, uh, we have a meeting ID and passcode for you to make it easy if, in case you don't have the app. Andy. Uh, and for everyone, I also want to mention we host Going Global every month. We pick a different topic every month um, and would love to welcome you back for further conversations in the new year. Thanks very much, everyone. Good night.
Thank you so much, uh, Chelsea, for putting this together, your team and uh, the MBA office team. So we really appreciate the opportunity for the students. Even though we couldn't go on a real trip, I think this <laughs> is fantastic. Yeah, thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Bye.